Student housing is such a unique industry. The more unique an industry is, the more important it is for that industry to have a resource and a platform to share ideas and data, to determine best practices, and a platform to simply promote networking among the professionals in that industry. That's what we are setting out to provide with Student Housing Insight. But what's even more unique about the student housing industry is how unique those professionals are. They want to make a positive impact on the students and the university communities they serve. They understand they have an opportunity to touch the future. They come to work every day looking for ways to make that future bright. If you're one of those people, come be a part of Student Housing Insight. There we go. I was on mute, guys. Sorry about that. Welcome to Shop Talk, everyone. For March, I am Wesley Dees. I'm the CEO of Student Housing Insight. If you don't know anything about Student Housing Insight, we have a, um, a podcast on student housing, and we also do a lot of other things for the industry. So go check us out at studenthousinginsight.com. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Let's go ahead and jump into that. Um, first of all, I want to encourage everybody to use the chat widget over on the right-hand side. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible, and if there's comments you want to make about the things being presented and um, uh, anything like that, make sure that you, that you put it there. And then also there's a Q&A section, so if you've got any questions for <clears throat> myself or any of the panelists, um, make sure you put them there versus the chat so that I can see them and, and get straight to them. Also, if you want to come onto the to the uh, virtual stage and you know ask a question of our panelists or um, make a comment, you can certainly do that as well. Just go to that request to speak button, and we can um, we can get you on the stage that way. You'll go through a couple of prompts. All right, well, let's talk about our update from NMHC. Matthew, how are you? Good. How you doing, Wes? I am doing fantastic, although I'm starting to wonder where my spring went to because I had to put on a jacket in South Carolina on March 14th today. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. It's windy, breezy, and cold up here in the Washington area, too, so I know exactly how you feel. Well, hey, um, I know last month you guys were coming off the, um, off the hills of, the, uh, of your annual meeting in Vegas, and um, we had a lot of updates <clears throat> from that coming from David last week, but, or last month, but tell us what you've got um, on tap for everybody this month that we need to be aware of. Yeah. So there's, there's two things and thanks for having me on again, uh, Wes, it's great to be here with everybody. So um, housing affordability is the big topic of discussion um, in uh, Washington, DC. And that sort of has some tangential um, impacts on the student housing in industry that sort of spill over the conventional side. So just might make the point that um, our brand new NMHC president, Sharon wilson Genot testified uh, before the United States Senate Finance Committee last Tuesday on affordable housing tax incentives. Uh, and she made um, sort of three major points during her testimony. One is that we are, the housing affordability crisis that the nation is facing on the conventional side is really one that has to do with uh, housing supply uh, and the lack thereof. Uh, the second um, point she made is the tax incentives would be very helpful to solving that issue. But for our purposes, it's really the third point that I think is extremely important that she made, which is that there's just too much, um, too many regulatory burdens um, out, out there that, that uh, are really preventing um, building um, and construction from, from going on. And that really has an um, impact on the student housing industry as well. And she made the point that um, there's NMHC and home builder research that shows that, you know, 40.6% of the cost um, is, is really these regulations. And some of them are, you know, health, basic health and safety stuff that is you know, absolutely necessary. But a lot of these regs um, are, are things at the state and local level that can be done without uh, and that really increase our costs. Um, I'd also just like to mention that the NMHC Student Housing Research Foundation um, just also put out a cost study um, last week um, that's on our website that I would encourage uh, folks to look at that look that compare sort of rent in the conventional and student housing family spaces uh, and notes that the two 
um, you know, sort of move, move together. Um, so I'd encourage folks to folks to look at that. But the basic point of the testimony from our purposes here is that sharing is really all about reducing barriers um, to um, development and construction. Um, interesting, last week, President Biden also released his fiscal year 2024 uh, budget. Um, and his budget um, includes a lot of tax proposals that he's proposed in the past that would really um, diminish our ability to develop and operate student housing properties. Um, so among them, he would sharply increase marginal income tax rates um, as well as those on capital gains. He would basically do away with like-kind exchanges as we know them, tax carried interest at ordinary uh, income rates, uh, tax unrealized capital, uh, and tax unrealized capital gains at death. And when you sort of put all that stuff together, um, in addition to, by the way, imposing the net investment income tax on active business income and not just your passive capital gains, um, you're looking at, for example, a 44.6% tax rate on uh, capital gains um, for those impacted taxpayers. And, and we really feel that that's going to, you know, really Im impinge on our ability to develop, to develop and operate um, properties just from the uh, perspective of ensuring there's sufficient capital availability. So bottom line on that is that with the Republican Congress or the Republican House of Representatives uh, this time around um, and with Democratic Congress having rejected a lot of those tax increases last time, it's very unlikely they're going to pass this Congress. But what I would say is this, is we have to be very vigilant. And we are in educating members of Congress because at the end of 2025, a lot of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act provisions that impact our industry, um, such as the rate cuts for pass-throughs um, and the business deduction for pass-throughs expires. And what the president is doing is he's laying out sort of his marker for uh, how he wants tax policy to look like when Congress and the president start debating how to deal with that with those all those expiring provisions. So if he wins re-election uh, next year, this is sort of his marker uh, as to where they want to go when they start negotiating. So we want to make sure that you know taxes are kept at reasonable levels to ensure that we're able to invest um, and, and develop. Um, and with that. A, I'll stop um, and be happy to take any questions if Wes uh, approves of that. Yeah, I don't. I don't see any questions that have come up. Okay. yet, but I think that's. Uh, uh, yeah, that's obviously some some big news. And um, as much as I hate to ever get political on something like this, that's it's good information to uh, to certainly hear. Um, and yeah, everybody go vote. Um, <clears throat> In, uh, yeah, I don't see anything else, Matt. Um, I'm assuming we'll see you at Interface here in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, Rich. It's great to see you um, on, on camera here. Super looking forward to seeing you um, early next month down in Austin. You always put on a great show, and we're looking forward to it again this year. Well, great. Looking forward to seeing you. Well, Rich, thanks for joining us. It is that time of the year, <laughs> that time that we showcase um, yourself as well. In fact, we just put out a uh, podcast uh, yesterday, Sunday night, something like that, um, that you and I did a few weeks ago, kind of highlighting some of the things that are happening. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we brought you on to Shop Talk because Interface Student Housing Conference is the is the biggest conference in the in the industry, and wanted uh, you to just share some time with us on on what you've got on tap and um, any other announcements you want to make. Thanks, Wes. Um, and by the way, great to see you, Matthew. Uh, Matthew will be in Austin and hosting a roundtable. Um, and some of those things he just said sounded very scary. So uh, a lot of people should go to his roundtable on Monday, April 3rd and talk about that. Um, yeah, Interface Student Housing is now less than three weeks away. Uh, three weeks from now, we'll be there in Austin. Uh, it's going to be great. Um, we have over 1,100 attendees now. And there's usually a kind of a rush at the end. Uh, so I imagine that we might be even over last year's attendance number, which was a record. Uh, we have 22 panel sessions. We have the Innovator Awards. And now we have a banking crisis. Um, nothing a conference producer likes more than some kind of crisis to arise. So uh, what's going on with the banking world uh, certainly has taken everybody by surprise in the last three or four days. Uh, and should actually make for some pretty interesting conversation, I would think, in Austin. If that's still uh, if that's still happening in a couple of weeks, but yeah, we're looking forward to bringing the industry together. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting time, of course, for the industry. Things are going so well when it comes to leasing and rental rates and occupancy. 
And yet on the other end of the scale, when it comes to investment deals and development deals, and it's just so hard to get anything done right now with the financing situation and the bid ask gap and all that. So um, plenty of good things to talk about. Well, fantastic. And again, we're at the, at the JW, anything else, um, uh, you know, as far as getting to, to Austin or, or anything that you want to make sure everybody's aware of? Um, no, I think we have a lot of people coming in, you know, this year we start on a Monday. Um, and I think there are actually a lot of people coming in over the weekend or, or at least for Sunday night, uh, to be there and maybe do a dinner Sunday and, and be there to do meetings on Monday. Um, we start with our first session on Monday around one thirty, another session around, uh, two 15. And then we have our round tables from three 30 to five followed by the cocktail reception. Uh, and then, you know, obviously a full day on Tuesday and a very full half day on Wednesday. Great, great. And one other thing I wanted to mention here, um, we announced last month about the uh, Emerging Leader Scholarship that the W Collective um, was handing out for um, some very special woman um, that, that wrote a, an essay and, and submitted everything. That voting, I believe, Erica said, ended last night. So I think they're going to make that announcement tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So um, I know we'll put it out on, you know, on our social media. I'm sure Interface will as well. So um, congrats to, to everybody that um, submitted their, their essay for that and looking forward to meeting that winner on that. Because I believe the winner is going to be on the W Collective panel as well, correct? That's right. Yeah, the W Collective panel will be on Tuesday afternoon. Um, and yes, that uh, winner will be on with... Uh, a lot of the core leadership of the W Collective, as well as some of the, um, you know, women in the industry who have been in the industry for a long time and really have been, I think, kind of the inspiration to help get this started. So it should be, uh, if it's anything like last year's session, it will be fantastic. Um, last year was tremendous a standing ovation at the at the end of the session. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that again this year. Fantastic. Well, we just uh, launched a poll a little bit ago of who's planning on going to Interface. Uh, 50% booked and ready to go, 41% not this year, and 8% still deciding. So if you're still deciding, um, you better hurry up. Those, are there any rooms left at either of the hotels? Uh, Austin's a big city. There's plenty of rooms somewhere. Uh, <laughs> the JW, I think, is full. The Hyatt place, uh, I think it might be full, uh, although there may be other rooms there. But, yeah, there's there's plenty of hotels right around the JW. We, we have room. We welcome, we welcome the 8%. Great, great. Well, Rich, I appreciate it. We're going to move on to our next segment, which is going to be on the College House um, report for this, this month. So let's go ahead and get over to that. Charlie, right, while well, I'm switching well. up the slide deck here, why don't you tell us about our – thanks, Rich. Uh, why don't you tell, tell everybody about our guest today? Yes. Uh, Jason Fort, the EVP of New, Devel New Business uh, Development over at Asset Living. Uh, he – what is it, 20 years now in student housing? Plus 19 – 30 years in student housing, 19 in Asset Living. Yeah, so uh, a breadth of knowledge, although he uh, is a Texas A&M Aggie, uh, we still <laughs> like him. But um, no, Jason um, is, is um, you know, in our pre-call as we're discussing, you know, um, it's, it's a very unique perspective as it relates to our, our panel today as we talk a little bit more about what we're, look, you know, I guess forward looking, um, given how assets structured with, you know, the large student portfolio and even larger uh, multifamily. So we can be able to kind of compare and contrast, give the sentiments of the doom and gloom over on the conventional side, and then really kind of hammer home um, just the positive fundamentals that the data, the data is supporting as well as, um, you know, just what you're hearing from developers, owners, investors, et cetera. So um, very excited to kind of hop through this. Uh, so this data is of the last two weeks, the first two weeks in March, um, you know, nationally, you know, we're, we're sitting exceptionally strong. 55.5% is a national pre-lease. Um, you can see here, you know, continued kind of upticks over the last two weeks, specifically on this, on the, uh, the six bedrooms, which again, of the large, of the smaller subset of beds that we're, we're tracking from a unit level perspective. But um, you can still see that that's great news that some of these larger unit types are still seeing some growth um, as it gets a little harder to, to find six people to live in a, a bed once you get later into the leasing cycle. Um, but from a national perspective, year over year, 
Um, let's go to the next one there, Wes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can see we're outpacing by about 8.6%. The last two updates we've had have been around that 8.485 number. So mm -hmm. pretty consistent here of the last you know six weeks or so. Um, and again, you know everything seemingly outperforming in a big way. Again, your three bedrooms as well as um, your four bedrooms, which are uh, a large subset of, of that individual unit type that we're tracking. Um, a lot is, I guess, supporting a lot of that growth, um, you know, from a pre-leasing perspective. Um, Jason, you know, from, from a, I guess, a wide-ranging portfolio over there to asset, you know, does this, does this information kind of hold true on what you're seeing, um, I guess, kind of agnostic of product type or, or um, proximity? Yeah, Charlie, we're actually seeing, and it's been this way for about the last two months, we're about 17.5% ahead of where we were last year. And really those numbers have, have held at about over 17% for the last two months. What we're really seeing, the, the tier one power fives are just killing it, rent growth wise, occupancy wise, pre-lease wise, but the tier two and tier three are really where we were struggling last year we're not struggling this year, and, and that's really helped our year-to-date numbers really almost hit close to 20%. It's just we're in a, in a time right now, student housing-wise, that most of us hadn't seen, and certainly a lot different than what's going on in the multifamily space for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and what we're seeing from that standpoint, just kind of echo, um, I mean, you look at the noise from a macro level, you know, affordability is, you know, a, a fancy buzz where I know uh, Matt just kind of touched on that. Um, and then additionally from an enrollment decline, uh, I think there was an article um, by the wall street journal or Forbes, you know, 1.2% decline. Um, I actually did an interview with Rich Kelly and the student housing business people, you know, we're not actually seeing a lot of that. And again, as we're going through and, and updating a lot of our 2022 data um, as they've slowly started reporting um, you know, your power five schools, we're seeing tremendous, uh, growth. When I say tremendous, you're talking two and three percent at some of these schools, like a Madison, Wisconsin, or even University of Cincinnati, for example, where, excuse me, um, you know that market performance is also um, correlating there, where you know there is a little bit of a of supply pipeline, but it shouldn't be necessary. It isn't necessarily scaring um, the market away. I, I know Jason talked about this on our pre-call, but like markets that I know you all are leasing up. Um, a couple deals like uh, Gainesville, Florida, or even Austin, Texas. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy to kind of see that if a developer can get a deal done as well as you know delivered on time, um, you know that 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 demand is there, um, not just from a pre -lease, pre leasing perspective, but also from a rate perspective. I want I want to go back really quick to something you just mentioned because um, you you said. Uh, you know, it's much different than what you see on the conventional side. And um, last month for this panel, we had Casey Schaefer on. And I remember in one of the preliminary meetings we had with him, he had just come off of that meeting with NMHC. Um, and, of course, that was, you know, everybody from a multifamily standpoint. And the conventional operators and owners um, seemed to be pretty – you know, down on <laughs> what was happening because rates were going down or they were certainly stagnant. And, uh, you know, from a student housing perspective, we have always trailed, you know, nine to 12 months because of our academic cycle behind conventional. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, from your perspective, two things. One, are you seeing that within assets portfolio between conventional and, and student? Um, because you guys have got a lot of both. And I, the second part of that question, I guess, is, you know, from your perspective, do you feel like we're going to see rates go flat in the fall um, from with student housing? Or do you think we've still got some more increases there? Yeah, well, it's, it was crazy. The, the event last month in Vegas was a very somber event. You saw a lot of people, you know, in the multifamily space with interest rates going up and, and deals not trading, deals not being able to get done. And then you know, rental rates really being flat or in some of the hotter markets, you're seeing two to 3% rent growth. You're seeing a lot of concessions. The meetings that we had on the multifamily side were, you know, I, I wouldn't say they were great. I, I would say that they were okay. Um, but the predicting for the future was certainly not what we saw a year ago or 18 months ago 
then we started talking about our student deals and we're talking about 10%, 15% rent growth. We're talking about properties that are already full in the pre-lease. We're talking about the future. And and I don't think this is going to stop. I, I think this really? rent growth that, that Charlie's seeing and his data is is definitely going to be there for the fall. And I think it's two or three years that, that we're going to see consistent rent growth. These power five, you look at, at UCF, you look at, you know, Tempe at Arizona state, um, you know, Knoxville, West Lafayette. I mean, these rent growths are, are, you know, something we've never seen before and it's not going to stop anytime soon. That, that gap between multifamily and student is certainly closing soon, but with COVID and the lack of development and, you know, these supply and demand numbers at some of these universities, it's, it's, prime for the picking right now. So it's an exciting time to be involved in student housing for sure. Well, fan, that's fantastic news. I, I'm glad you're glad you're optimistic on that. Cause um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see another, another year of some increases for sure. Yeah. I um, think um, to that point uh, we, I was, I ran the, uh, I shared the fundamentals on the CBRE national call a couple of weeks ago. And I think that Jacqueline then put out a, put out a poll that was, what do you expect rent growth to be? And I think the vast majority said somewhere between three and 8%. So I think that sentiment is not just, you know, from us three, but also from the broader market as well, that there still is that pent up demand. And a lot of that, again, supported here where, you know, you're, you're seeing growth, even in your more expensive unit types and your studios and ones. And, but, you know, at, you know, an average rate of 772, a bed on a three bedroom, I mean, there's still wiggle room to go up there, um, especially, you know, as as if, if, you know, enrollment does trick up, trickle up at, in these tier one power five universities um, and the supply keeps um, dwindling down. So uh, yeah. great time to be an owner. And also, you know, if you can get a development deal done, um, there's there's that runway there from a growth perspective. Hey, before we jump off rates here, I want to ask Jason another question. Uh, you know, when it comes to. What's that? I think we lost Jason. Oh, we did, didn't we? All right. Jason, if you can hear us, just uh, hit the request to speak again, and we'll bring you on. So, anyway, I'll, I'll ask Jason when he comes back in, but anything else with these year-over-year and, and week-over-week? No, I mean, oh. it's, things have stayed relatively consistent. Um, I wish I had – better good news. Right. Uh, but I mean, you know, from a numbers perspective, the student housing industry continues to just show, you know, some of the strongest fundamentals that, you know, in the last three and a half years that we've been around, um, it, it's, it's pretty wild to see Jason's back here. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Shit the wrong button, Jason. I, I don't know what happened. It, it froze up on me for some, somehow. Well, hey, I was just about to ask you a question before we move off of rates, and I know we're going to kind of deep dive a little bit on the on the Western region. I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you know, as we've talked all year, uh, you know, for this leasing season, the flagships and Tier 1, you know, they're doing fantastic, right? Um, <clears throat> some of that has – a lot of that has just been because they've had to increase their in-state tuition because, – or not tuition, but their in-state enrollment – um, because a lot of those flagship were flagships were not able to recruit from international students. Plus, there's a drop off that's happening with Gen Z, and they wanted to get ahead of that. Um, and so that's hurt, you know, certainly the tier three and some of the some of the tier two. But what's amazing from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing as well is, even in those markets they're still able to pull out a, you know, three, even high as 6% rate increase, even if they're behind year over year from a pre-leasing standpoint. Are you seeing a lot of that as well? Yeah, Wes, that's been what's been most surprising this year. I expected it at the, at the bigger universities, but these tier two and tier three universities with the pre-lease occupancy we're seeing and the rent growth that we're seeing, it's just not something that we've seen since before COVID. And it's, it, it's good to see. It's very, um, it's very exciting to see from ours. And that's really helped with our um, year over year rent growth and our year over year pre-lease occupancy rent growth. It's, it's certainly a positive for the student housing space. Right. 
Charlie, anything anything else on tier two or tier three? Are you ready? No. ready to get into I mean, again, there's uh, again we going back to the data we pulled together for the CB recall. I mean, there's still growth there. It's just not as uh, astounding as you would see. It's you know the tier ones and and a lot of the tier two schools even um, to that matter. But um, you know the benefit you know, across the board. I mean, we're covering 265 cities now. I mean, there's probably about a hundred, um, give or take, um, from a tier one perspective about the same for tier two, but then that tier three, I mean, it's still six, you know, six, 65, 66 markets or so, um, which is thrown in again on this year over year number. And, you know, you know, Jason mentioned, you know, 17%. I mean, they're still getting, you know, six to eight, um, depending on what it is. And then six, eight percent on pre-lease and occupancy, or pre-lease and rate growth, excuse me. Um, but again, there's always the exceptions. There's some that are completely full, almost like a DJ, like Daytona, Florida, like rent grows through the roof, released up maybe too quickly. And then there's some that may be falling a little bit behind. So, um, you know, again, every market's different, but from, from from the aggregate, you know, things look pretty, pretty exceptional from tier one through tier three, um, tier one, again, being kind of leading that charge. Um, but as we dive in here a little bit, um, you know, I know, from the, on the West Coast perspective, uh, COVID was a little bit, they were a little bit more risk averse um, per se uh, back in 19, 20, 20, you know, kind of later in 21. You're, li- um, you're lumping a lot of states into the West region by saying that. <laughs> yes, but. There were a few that were not that way. <laughs> there were a few that were not that way. Uh, I will say that, um, you know, California, you know, as you know, along the coast, Washington, Oregon, um, for the most part. But as you as we look here, you know, roughly about 50 markets in this subset. Um, and if you want to jump over to the next slide, Wes, we look here. And again, uh, one thing to note, the West Coast does start on average, you know, uh, a couple of weeks after more of the Southeast, Southwest, Midwest, Northeast uh, markets. So um, behind the national average, but that's not uh, for lack of performance. Um, you can see they're still roughly about. Um, you know, roughly about 6% ahead or so, give or take. And, you know, from a standpoint of, of where that rate grows coming from, it's, as you look at the ones and the twos, you know, the cost of living a little higher on that West Coast, um, you know, average rates are, are much higher than you would find in the Southeast, Southwest. Um, you know, you're still seeing, you know, pretty pretty significant, rate, yeah. For example, here on the one bedrooms and here on the studios, um, and if you go back to that other side, you can see, that they may have gotten a little too aggressive on the studios where that yeah, releasing is a little inverted. So um, they're still, you know, still moving along. Um, but again, from that rate growth perspective, um, you know, people are still pushing, getting aggressive where I think the Western, the West coast last year uh, was somewhere around 93 ish percent. So maybe 50 to hundred basis points behind what the national average was around 94, but still, um, you know, they're, they're seeing some significant, Increases there, and I think a lot of the operators, given that little later lease or leasing cycle, have got a little more aggressive on the West Coast because they saw how quickly, like Knoxville leasing up in a day, and you know the you know some of these other larger markets seeing you know that demand there um, getting a little more aggressive as it relates to um, some of those more preferred unit types. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's amazing where you can see on those studios, they yes. go about three hundred bucks, and then yeah, it looks like everybody's moving over to the twos and getting a roommate so mm-hmm. so um but yeah so the one thing that we've we've definitely seen as it relates to the west coast is that i got there was a little bit of trouble there in 21 and 20 and 21 from covid but a lot of that's bounced back i know jason we were talking um about some of just stuff you're tracking i mean for the new yeah we, we we've seen a strong comeback in california when we look at San Jose and Sacramento at Sac State, um, St. Louis Obispo, you know, Turlock, Chico, those markets a year ago, we were all scared about and, and the, the numbers really hit it. We, we weren't getting the numbers that we're getting now, but you, you look at those West Coast numbers right now at, at USC, uh, the numbers are great. Um, so California is really rebounding it, it, you know, it took a long time after COVID, but we're finally coming back. And you look at some of the other, you know, West coast States, you look at, you know, uh, Seattle, you know, Bellingham, Montana, the whole state of Utah. I mean, there's some good things going on on the West coast and certainly some development opportunities for, for people out there. Yeah. And I know the, uh, I think it was 
Governor Newsom uh, allocated a, you know billions of dollars for on-campus housing um, there across the, the the Cal State University system, but haven't really seen much actually being built. Uh, a lot of announcing. Another you know you Google Dormzilla, um, you can see what they're trying to throw up in Santa Barbara. But um, you know again we can the private market can move a little bit quicker um, than a lot of that from from the academic side. So. Um, Definitely, you know, strong across the board. And again, it's great to see that bounce back there on the Western region uh, from a little bit of a dip there due to, you know, true to the COVID, right? It's not a fundamental or a, uh, a foundational issue there. Um, yeah, when when you don't put windows in a dorm um, <laughs> that faces the beach, you have a big problem. So. We, you and I have had so much fun yeah, on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on LinkedIn with that. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. oh, guys. Well, um, no, I, you know, continuing, you know, the strong fundamental push and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot of information to share. We're actually at Interface um, in the next three weeks. Excited to see all of you there. Um, but Wes, as always, thank you so much for, for doing this. And Jason, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, Wes, we appreciate it. We love what you do and, and love getting to get on and, and get on Shop Talk. It's awesome. Well, uh, tell Julie, she sent me an email after we got started here. She couldn't find the link. So uh, let her know. <laughs> I'll, as soon as I get it up on YouTube, I'll, I'll send her the replay. Will do. All Have right. a good day, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Will, how are you? Hey, you're on mute, Will. Uh, of course. I'm doing yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on. So we've got a couple of people that are coming on here with you. We're going to start talking about supply chain. Let me get some things moved over with my slides. Um, will, if you will, as we're waiting on other folks to, to come on board, um, just would like to have you introduce yourself really quick and what you do at Cardinal. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, will Conroy, I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Offerings at Cardinal and all of our national agreements fall in my wheelhouse. So any of our big procurement agreements um, or any of our national uh, agreements that apply to our managed sites uh, are things that I work on and, and uh, work with those partners really closely. So excited to uh, be on today. Well, great. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. And I think we've got Lisa has, she, I, I was bringing her on, but she dropped off. So Lisa, if you hear me, make sure you hit that request to speak. And um, Wade Griffin as well with Sherwin-Williams, if you'll have that request to speak, I will bring you guys on board. Michael, you're with Omnia Partners, if you would. Um, introduce yourself and, and what you do at Omnia and uh, probably a little bit about what Omnia does as well. Yes, sir. So thank you, Wes. Um, Vice President, Higher Education Northeast for Omnia Partners. We're a national cooperative and we work with uh, <clears throat> public sector, but across the university, college and university space, and have contracts that they have the ability to, to, to piggyback on, and uh, look forward to the conversation, and uh, good stuff. Well, great. We've got Lisa coming in, and Wade is, is on the way here. So uh, tell us a little bit, Michael, before we get, while we're waiting on everybody here, you deal a lot with, directly with the higher ed institutions in the country. Yes. and supplying things with them. I'm just kind of curious from a supply chain standpoint and a, a timing of, of, you know, getting products and materials. Is it similar to what, what you guys typically see on the off-campus side as well? Yes, and I'm glad you asked because pursuant to the previous conversation, so <clears throat> COVID obviously supply chain was constricted. We're seeing that loosening up across a number of areas. But one of the dynamics that we've seen is projects with, uh, as it relates to uh, on-campus housing, they put on hold. And now there's a push from both the academic side, the parents and students getting back on campus and they can't accommodate that. So that increases the, the demand for, you know, multifamily and off-campus housing. So it really is something that uh, is, is, uh, a dynamic that is, is pursuant to, in today's environment. Well, fantastic. Um, Lisa, before I introduce you here really quick, let me just say something to Wade. Um, Wade, I got your message. Um, I'm not seeing it on my end, so you may want to log out, log back in, and hit that request to speak button, and I'll, and I'll bring you up. 
Lisa with University Furnishings, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. I sorry I had to reconnect. I was thinking that I wasn't going to be able to show my face, and I, I, I waste a pair of eyelashes I put on the back. <laughs> <laughs> How's everybody? I think we're all doing great. I guess um, my first question, just right off the bat, even before introduction, are we all going to get our furniture on time this year? You absolutely are. Um, you absolutely are. Okay. Uh, phone call's over with. I think that's all we wanted to. Uh... Yep, you have that on recording, so we're good. <laughs> well, Lisa, if you will, tell, uh, for those that don't know you and University Furnishing, um, please introduce yourself. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. I am Lisa Dillon. I'm the Executive Vice President and one of the partners of University Furnishings, and we um, supply, obviously, furniture, in-unit furniture, for mostly privatized student housing. We do a little bit of on-campus, but for the most part, our love is privatized and that's where we stay. So um, we're blessed with a lot of market share and know a lot of folks in this industry and we're just thrilled to be invited to speak. And Wes, again, thank you so much for this. This is a wonderful thing you do for the industry. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, I think we finally got Wade here. How are you doing, Wade? I'm good, how are you guys? I'm doing fantastic. Of course, Wade is with Sharon Williams, which um, the student housing keep student housing industry keeps really busy uh, <laughs> during the during the summertime. No but Wade, if you would introduce yourself and and what you sure. do for Sharon, sure please. Yeah, appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, Wade Griffin, based here in uh, in Austin, Texas. Uh, so, uh, titled National Account Executive. So, you know, with student housing being a, a big part of what we do here, uh, you know, working with the with the local teams, making sure that everyone knows how to how to get everything ordered, uh, you know, getting them situated with their local sales reps, their, their local stores, and making sure that we do have that plan of attack once the, uh, the student turn season comes about. Well, fantastic. Well, again, thanks to, to all of you guys for making time today. I guess the first question I've got right off the, uh, kind of right off the bat that I know is going to be on everybody's mind is this. Are there any products, brands, or product categories for maintenance supplies uh, and uh, FF and E that student housing managers should expect longer delivery periods or low inventory or low inventory between now here in March and in September. I, I can take this one to start off because it's a better story for me this year than it had been the past couple of years. <laughs> um, so you know we we've we've never been in a uh, in a position as a as a paint supplier that we've ever had to tell anyone we didn't have anything to sell them. So obviously it's much better conversation now. Uh, you know, we'll still run into a couple minor uh, different products. Say you're, you're talking about some higher end industrial marine products, really not anything that you're going to see from a student housing aspect from the type of products that we're needing out there. Uh, so for the most part, paint's good. Uh, you know, we still want to have that plan of attack and making sure that each community, the, the manager, the maintenance team know, you know, who to reach out to from their, their local team at the local level to make sure that they know what products we're going to need to be providing, what the time frame is. You know, how much were they going to need out there? Uh, flooring is, uh, and, and we do flooring as well. And, and talking to our our vendors from a Mohawk or a Shaw, uh, engineered floors, the other ones that are out there. For the most part, they're good as well. Uh, you might run into some specific products for some commercial type products, maybe in the hallways, uh, that you're still looking at maybe an eight to ten week lead time to be able to get that type of material. But for the most part, for what you're looking for in carpet, plank, sheet vinyl, anything that you're typically going to need for unit turns, uh, they're going to have that in stock. And, and again, just working with the, with the local teams, if we are doing flooring with you guys to make sure that uh, we do have that idea, that understanding of how long it's going to take, you know, what the time frame is, when we need to have the, the local uh, vendors and contractors actually doing the work to be committed on that time frame. So. I, I apologize for taking all the time, but I wanted to, to say it because it is just a better story for us now. <laughs> Lisa, Michael. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I echo it, it certainly has leveled out to, I mean, for the most part. Um, of course, we said that last year and then the rail yard situation happened. So we're keeping our deadlines early as we have the last few years. Um, that's already gone by January and February. I still, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I still am getting requests even as early as this morning for, you know, even large quantity deals that are wanting it this summer. And of course, being the ultimate salesperson that I am, I'm trying with everything I am to get those deals done. But 
Um, we, as always, stock a lot at our Dallas warehouse, 250,000 square foot warehouse. And we have a lot in stock um, that we plan for last minute deals and things like that. So um, I agree. I think that it has leveled out to a, to, to a big degree and we're cautiously optimistic this year. Uh, it's interesting that you uh, that you mentioned you're still taking phone calls. I just put a published a poll um, for those that are that um, can see that. Have you ordered all of your replacement furniture yet? So we'll see uh, here in a couple minutes what that ends up looking like. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we our, our our order deadline was January for July deliveries and August. I mean, excuse me, February for August deliveries. Listen, we're still taking orders and we're just giving the dates as we can do them. And again, we have a lot in stock too. And that is the key. Um, so yeah, it's the replacement orders for the most part. We're very um, blessed that our clients have been able to sort of back up a little bit and move those, um, move those order dates back for us. So yeah, I think we're good. Great. And I would, yeah. And echo Lisa's comments. I mean, what we've seen, especially, you know, you spoke to furniture, but the appliance side. So, mm -hmm. you know, folks are just pushing out and manufacturers or distributors are making sure that they extend those uh, lead times to make sure that they have product in stock to, to deliver when needed. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, Will, you're obviously on the operator side, and uh, is everything they're saying seem to be true for for you as well is that what you're seeing on the on the inside of that yeah i think it's true it's certainly better than than previous years but i think to lisa's point where she kind of kept the deadlines early still that's kind of the posture that we're in is you just don't know what's going to happen and and things can take you by surprise so you know michael made a great point on appliances really think that appliances are one of those product categories or, or um, HVAC, especially if you have specialty HVAC equipment. Um, those are things that you want to get out ahead of. And, and maybe in years past where you felt confident, ah, if I found an appliance that I need to do a quick replacement, I can get that you know to the site relatively quickly. I think this year we're trying to be in a more proactive posture where maybe we have a couple of spare units on site for, for those needs just because we know that those those timelines for delivery are are extended. If you talk to your reps, um, especially on the procurement side, they're very cautious as well to commit to a specific timelines. And so uh, while we hope things are going to get better, we think it's going to be certainly better than the past couple of years for turn, really trying to keep some of those proactive measures in place. So we're set up for success uh, for what's always, you know, our busiest time of the year on site. Gotcha. So my next question is this, um, are there any suggestions that, that student housing managers, um, as they're planning out the rest of their summer turn that you guys want to make them aware of? I mean, for us, it's just exactly what we said, order early, um, you know, meet the deadlines of what the companies are asking for. That would be my main thing. I would say, you know, turn is is about supply, but it's also a lot about labor. Um, and and I would say really try to get out ahead of your labor contracts, um, especially in markets that maybe have, you know, tier two, tier three markets that have some constrained labor supplies. There's only so much uh, to go around. And if there's a lot of other complexes in the marketplace, you don't want to be the last one uh, holding the bag, so to speak, or, or short of people to help out on site. And so, again, while maybe the goods would be there, it doesn't do you much good if you don't have the right labor to help clean and paint, uh, install, do punch, you know, whatever, whatever yeah. those things are. So, yeah, really focus on that, that, uh, that labor side. And, you know, the other thing I would say just on, on uh, paint and, and maybe Wade can weigh in on this is in the beginning of COVID, there were sh supply shortages, but there also seemed to be some changes of tints. And even though it may have been the same color, you put it on the wall, it doesn't look quite like last year's shade. And so right. one of the things that, that we're trying to uh, push on to our teams is, you know, paint a few walls early with the paint colors that you think you're going to be using. Because if that tint doesn't match up, you want to know that first so you can call Wade and, and order some more supply to plan to paint some more full walls instead of doing touch up. And those things really matter. That has a big, um, a big impact on how you know, the quality of the unit, how it's perceived by a renter moving in and also on how much labor you need and, and how much supply do you need to order and, and all those things. So I would focus on, on some of those uh, to get out ahead of turn, maybe control some of the risk uh, at your sites. 
So it's inter interesting you brought up the thing with the tent. I've got another poll question here, but before I specifically with paint, before I post that, um, Lisa, it was a hundred percent. Everybody said they they've already checked that box with with ordering furniture. So at least at least our audience are not the ones that called you yesterday. That is awesome. That is yeah. I won't mention any names. <laughs> So the next one I'm publishing is, do you order your property's paint or does your paint vendor order it? That's uh, that, that seems to be a hot topic every year of who's going to be ordering that. So, um, yeah. And, and, and that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, and, and it goes back to maybe not necessarily the, the tent that we are using, but more so just the, the product bases and, and product lines that we're able to provide throughout you know, the, the past couple of years when we were dealing with the raw material shortages from the winter storm that came through. Uh, so again, at this point now, we, we have just about everything back in stock, but it is important to know a lot of different factors from what the product was that was applied originally. So we can use this, the exact same product. Uh, even getting it from the exact same store is going to make a difference because each, each different machine is going to shake it differently, you know, add tint just a little bit differently. And just a fraction of difference on that, it, it can it can cause a change in it. Uh, Will's absolutely correct. It'd be great to be proactive on that and making sure that we do some test areas, making sure that we know exactly what the product is and that it's going to touch up for you. Uh, and then, you know, having a plan of attack moving from there to make sure that we have, again, just the right products from the right store uh, and having it in there. You know, we, can, we can deliver it early. We can have it on site. You know, when you do that, you would want to make sure that it is in a, in a controlled environment. So it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. Uh, if it's been sitting there for the for a while, as far as paint, you want to make sure that it's been shaken up really well and everything is is uh, is uniform uh, prior to actually painting it out as well. Um, the other thing too is it makes a big difference between uh, depending on how it was applied as well. If they came in originally and sprayed the walls, it's going to be more difficult to try to get any type of product to touch up, whether you're using a brush or roller. Uh, if you're trying to go back with spray, trying to do the exact same application that you had originally. And our local teams, they can work through those types of things as well to make sure that they understand what the best roller cover, what the best brush is, what you know, spray tip size to use when they're working with either the maintenance team that might be doing it in-house or the contractors that might be doing the work as well. Yeah. So, Will, what's, what's the recommendation? Roll or spray? <laughs> oh, I mean, a lot of it depends on the capabilities of the local contractor. That exactly, <laughs> it's hard. To, it's hard to say. You're going to get a different level of, of quality from you know your painters in a in a major metro as you as you would in a tier three student market in a rural market. So whatever gets the paint on the walls is probably my answer uh, <laughs> for a turn. You know, the, the rule is uh, don't make the local news. That's the first rule of turn. Uh, every right. year. And so if the paint gets on the walls, if it's sprayed or rolled, you know, it's, you're probably not on the local news. So yeah, yeah I would say whatever, uh, whatever gets it done for, uh, for your markets. Michael, any other suggestions? No, actually, I just learned a lot about how to paint. So thank you. I took as many notes as I could, but yeah, it, it's really about planning. And again, most schools don't wake up and say, Hey, we're going to build a new building. We're going to renovate. So they've got capital plans in place, but uh, from the schools that we interact with, they're cognizant of the supply chain issues and they're trying to stay ahead of them. So it's, it's really about being proactive and staying ahead of the plan. So. Gotcha. Well, I want to go back to what Will brought up earlier. Um, well, actually, before I get to that, um, and that's going to be on labor force, which I know everybody's uh, you know, wanting to talk about. But, um, and Michael, I think this may be, Probably the best question for you. Are there any products that had significant price increases? And by that, I mean more than 7% since last summer, um, either recently or maybe even projected before July. So we, quite honestly, we've seen a lot with resins and such. And, and again, we deal outside of this area, but medical. So there are people that provide needles and syringes. So resins and some of the steels and that sort of thing have really, have really increased significantly which should have a trickle down effect into the other areas. But I, I defer to, to the other folks in the call to see how it's affected their industry. So the one place that we've seen um, pretty significant increases, um, you know, I always say we're a logistics company that sells furniture. It's kind of that way when you're delivering as much as we are and where we're seeing significant price increases is in, you know, warehousing, 
labor, um, trucking, those kind of things. So basically, yeah. um, in an installation pricing situation, um, it, we, we've seen significant increases there. Um, and that's a pass through cost for us. It's not a profit center line for us, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a lot. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think you'll see, I mean, inflation is the, has been the buzzword for the past year. And I think, you know, every door hammer, doorknob, you know, anything that you're ordering for a turn, you're, you're probably going to feel that. Um, if, especially if you're looking at costs two years ago or, or uh, three years ago, I also think the thing to expect is turn comes with a ton of ancillary costs and all those have gone. Up. If you're traveling to a site, the airfare is going to be more expensive. The hotel is more expensive. The car rental is more expensive. You know, your electricity costs have gone up incredibly. So your vacant unit electricity costs or gas costs, you know, those are going to go up or, or uh, you know, they're going to represent a larger part of your income statement than maybe um, years past. And, and yeah, warehousing for everyone has gone up. So their, their cost of goods um, goes up as well. So it'd be hard to isolate a, a product type that isn't going to feel, you know, those inflationary pressures, um, you know, because I think it, it's really going to touch almost everything that has to do with uh, student housing. Term. Well, I'm kind of curious um, with, with Cardinal, uh, you know, you guys are a large company. Um, I'm kind of wondering, are there things that you guys are looking at instead of, you know, the, the property manager, um, and the maintenance supervisor, you know, making the, the purchases or, or putting in the purchase orders and having them approve the, you know, the typical way. I'm wondering if there's things you guys are looking at from a company standpoint of, hey, why don't we just, you know, put all of our resources together and try to get the you know, cheapest price possible? Are there any items like that that you guys are looking at? Yeah, it's uh, we actually do business with Omnia, so I'll, I'll shout out Omnia. They've been really uh, good in in uh, making us smarter about the procurement space, uh, and really that's what we try to do for all of our clients. Is we try to aggregate our size or the size of our managed portfolios to put together contracts with large national suppliers that deliver discounts on everything. So so we've um, certainly as costs of materials have gone up, we've looked to add more suppliers. Um, and have more redundancy in our suppliers so that, you know, if you can't get something from somewhere and you have to go to another supplier, that we have a negotiated rate for those. And, you know, I would say, too, is it, it's it's tedious work. But if you go through and look at all of the different SKUs or, you know, all the items that are ordered, a lot of times you can work with an HD supply or a Lowe's um, or if you, you know, work with Omnia and say, hey, we order a ton of these materials, maybe you can get a negotiated rate on a certain product type, type or a certain set of products if you know you're going to order a bunch of them. If you know, hey, we're doing the same light bulb in all of our facilities, um, you can probably negotiate a good price for that light bulb. It takes some work to get down to that granular level, but often if, if you're doing it at scale, it can be worth it and it can be you know thousands or tens of thousands of dollars saved. Yeah. Uh, each year for turn. And, and and that's a great point. Standardization across, you know, do you need this? You need five different types of door stops, et cetera. So standardizing your product is huge and utilize Cardinal, utilize us to, to help negotiate those. But that, that can uh, dramatically increase cost savings as well as supply chain and the ability to get product. So great, great, great call out. Hey, before we get off of this question, go to the next. Anything on Sherwin's docket that's got more of a seven percent increase? No, and I, I would I would kind of express the same sentiment as as the other ones on this call as well. You know, being able to leverage uh, what we're doing as far as you know what what products are we needing. Typically, in multifamily and student housing, we are working through a, a core set of products, uh, and that's something that myself and, and my counterparts across the across the states will look at as far as you know looking at performas and seeing what the expectations are for the turn season and, and year over year to be able to negotiate that specific type of pricing. Uh, obviously we're, we're big partners with Omni as well. And we, we do have a, a catalog through them that we're able to provide back to uh, Omnia partners as well. Uh, the only difference I would say is not necessarily on the paint side, but more again, on the, on the floor, the flooring uh, products, you know, we've seen a lot of shifts from, from the flooring vendors from Ashaw and, and Mohawk and engineer floors to consolidate down their product lines. And in doing so, we have seen some of the, the previous products that they were using being discontinued or replaced with, with other products that might be more expensive than what it had been the year before. 
Uh, so again, it's it's working with the communities to to make sure that we have a good fit for them, whether that's in the price range or trying to keep the same design, same uh, you know the same patterns and things like that. But uh, for the most part, that's that's all pretty uh, pretty consistent right now. Gotcha. Hey, I'm going to ask this last question, but before I do that, um, if anybody's got a question for the for this panel, uh, please put it in the in the Q and A, and I'll I'll uh, make sure we get it to them. Um, <clears throat> Will, you talked a little bit about labor force earlier. I think we all know that the um, the price for labor has certainly <laughs> gone up. Um, but I'm just curious from from um, everyone's standpoint: is the is the labor force shortage getting any better? I I could say I, I'm sorry. I could say from our side, from uh, from paint labor or flooring labor, uh, they're both increasing on a on a standpoint from three to 4% and year over year, uh, which is projected out to about 2031. Um, but with the, with trying to replace the labor pool that's leaving, whether they're leaving the, the occupation altogether or they're retiring, uh, there's more demand than what there would be actually uh, labor to be able to do the, do the work. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah we're still seeing shortages. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of times we'll order more than what we need for a crew just to get the amount that we need. Um, say we need 16 guys, we're going to order 20 um, and they kind of come and go. So I think it I think it isn't getting better and it's getting more expensive, unfortunately. Yeah. Hey, Will, I saw uh, Jacob Kozier on here um, on the on the guest list here a little bit earlier. I don't know if he's still on there or not, but we got a discussion with him a couple of months ago about what you guys are doing as it relates to centralization, I'm just kind of wondering what, um, uh, is that, is that going over to, you know, what you guys are doing on the, on the turn side as well? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and Jacob's a pretty eloquent guy, so I'm sure he would uh, explain all this better than I would, but you know, it, it's hard to centralize maintenance labor um, because you still got to turn the wrench in the unit, right? The paint's got to get on the walls. The, the carpet has to get laid down. The, the work orders have to get punched. Um, but the other thing about turn is that you're still doing everything else. You're still doing operations. You're still collecting money. You, you know, you're still doing leasing. You're still doing a lot of customer service, fielding a ton of phone calls. Um, and I think a lot of the value that we'll see from our centralization initiatives is that it'll free up our onsite teams to focus more on the things that they can do in person. Yeah. So whether that's inspecting a unit, whether that's handling an in-person, you know, complaint or, or customer service need, if that's facilitating move in better or being more prepared because, you know, we can use in our centralization stack either, you know, a, a team member who can answer the phone, not on site, or if we've deployed an AI tool, a chat bot or, or something that can field a question uh, you know, you're going to get the same, when can I move in question yeah, yeah. a thousand times. And if you can have that easily answered by a chat bot or, uh, you know, another AI tool, there's ways to create that those efficiencies, even if they're not doing a turn task uh, or something like that. So definitely we're excited to see the impact this year now that Jacob's really built out an impressive platform and, and has started to grow his team quite a bit. Great, great. Uh, well, guys, I, I think that pretty much does it. Um, we're, we're out of time here, but I do want to mention that, um, Wade, going back to that question, do you order your property's paint or does your paint vendor? It was 66%. We order it and 33% the vendor orders it. So got it. for those yeah. 33%, you got to order it yourself. You can't, <laughs> I, I, that, that vendor is yeah. going to mark up that paint. So you, you better order that paint yourself if you're not doing well, it. Well, not just that, but you, you don't, you don't have control over what they're ordering too. So when we're trying to get something that's going to to touch up and, and give you the best finish to, to minimize costs, you lose a lot of that when the, when the contractor is making those decisions. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks so much for being a, a part of today's shop talk. I look forward to seeing most of you guys at, uh, at interface here in a few weeks. And until then, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, Wes. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Um, our next shop talk is going to be Thursday, April 13th, um, again at 1 p.m. Um, so we will send out uh, a uh, follow-up email to everybody tomorrow uh, with the replay link and um, then also a calendar invite for the one on April 13th. 
If you've got any questions, please, uh, about what was discussed today or something you want to forward on to one of the panelists, you can email me at Wes at studenthousinginsight.com. And we just ask that you please share Shop Talk with your colleagues. Send them to shoptalk.info and they can register there. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Have a good week.